I'm going to just jump right in. You know, welcome to the inauguration weekend. I'm going to jump right in. <laughs> the, um, what I'm going to do today is uh, read from notes uh, related to this topic, but also do literal readings from this topic. Um, the, these are all related to a book I literally, that's my uncle with the phone, <laughs> a, a, book, a book I literally just published, Jim Crow Wisdom. Um, it actually is released next Tuesday. Um, uh, that's my l only copy I have at this moment. Um, uh, Vera Wells, my friend and unofficial publicist, is, uh, <laughs> has been working uh, aggressively to change uh, the stocking of the books. I'm happy to report, actually, that the books, the first run is sold out. Um, wish the press had published more books, but they'll be coming. If you're interested in what I have to say, uh, please don't hesitate to order the more books. More books will be coming soon. In any event, I, uh, because this, this book is a mixture of traditional third-person omniscient history and first-person um, narrative, and I can explain why uh, in the Q&A, perhaps, if you're interested, uh, it's important for me that I actually read some, some of the sections because there is for lack of a better phrase, a performative element to the words I'm using uh, in the particular context. I want to start, though, I'll, I'll be reading from, or talking about, reading from the sixth and final chapter of the book, but I want to begin with the first words in, in the text uh, from the, the introduction. It's a poem uh, by Lucille Clifton. They ask me to remember, but they want me to remember their memories and I keep on remembering mine. I'm going to share three stories with you today. Story number one, lunatics. This first story is about Colonial Williamsburg. I went there, that is me. Um, uh, I went there in 1976, 1977 in fourth grade uh, growing up in the Potomac, Maryland, D.C. area, you make road trips to Williamsburg. It's just part of what you do in living in that part of the country. And I had a fantastic time. I did all of those things that tourists do, one of which is go into the stockade for a great picture, and then, you know, someone else comes along and you move on. Now, in my fourth grade imagination, I didn't notice many things, being an absent-minded fourth grader, I suppose, but over the course of the day, visiting the blacksmith, watching how glass is made, watching how candles are made, something just struck me as a little bit off. I realized that at some point during that day, I realized I didn't see any black people anywhere. Now, if you grew up in the Washington, D.C. area, to not see black people is a strange phenomenon. But we were here we were in Colonial Williamsburg. I didn't really know colonial history at the time, so maybe this is the way it was supposed to be. I didn't really know. But I thought that was, you know, I noticed that fact. Well, others noticed that fact as well and were bothered by this. And over the course of, this is in 1976-77, over the course of the next couple of decades, they worked very hard to change that. I'll come back to that in one second. On that same trip, when I discovered or noticed, huh, not many black people around here. That seems odd, I think. Uh, I was in um, a church uh, uh, somewhere on the Colonial Williamsburg campus, uh, and sitting next to my mother, who was a chaperone for the trip, and frankly, at this point, bored out of my mind and wanting to go home, and uh, leaning into her, when a friend starts nudging me in the ribs uh, with wide open eyes, saying, you know, basically saying, look, look, look. I'm not really paying attention to the tour guide. All I hear her saying is, we know a, lo we know a lot about the history of this place, by the names that are carved on the pew doors. That's what got his attention. He looked at the pew door. And what he noticed there got his attention, and why I got nudged in the ribs, is that the person who owned that pew, who paid the money to support the upkeep of the church, who was a prominent family member, or he came from, represented a prominent family in, in that era, a person about whom we know a lot, according to the tour guide, because of the way of the prominence he played in the community, his name was John Holloway. These histories tell us certain things. They don't tell us other things. 
years would go by, and I, this memory drifted out of my mind, and then I discovered uh, the fact that historians knew that uh, roughly half or more than half of the colonial Williamsburg population was black. That was seeping out into the public awareness. At the same time, curators at Colonial Williamsburg are trying to figure out how to tell a new story. And in fact, I just, I didn't even catch your name. Your, your mother was involved in writing the story, I just found out, just five minutes ago, which is pretty cool. Um, in any event, um, um, a new story is being told. And part of that story eventually came to involve um, a slave auction. And in the mid-1990s, the auction is actually finally going to go off. And people are very concerned about it. There's a lot of protests from uh, uh, well-meaning people of all different uh, characters, races, and political persuasions. But the auction does happen. The backlash was intense. And here I'll turn to the text itself. When R. Emmett Terrell Jr., journalist and editor of The American Spectator, heard about the plans for the auction, he wrote a blistering editorial that ran in the Washington Times. Unpack my bags. The family summer excursion to Colonial Williamsburg is canceled. The politically correct uplifters have just brought their gruesome hallucination of American history down on once charming Williamsburg. No longer is it is a fit place for family outings. Perhaps if one's family is composed of neurotics and hysterics, Williamsburg is worth a visit. But cheerful, discerning families had best pursue more intelligent recreation. Not long ago, mom and dad could pack the children into the family gas guzzler and drive off to Williamsburg for a pleasant, albeit idealized, immersion into a facsimile of America's 18th century colonial life. Standing on nearly 170 acres and nearly 100 reproductions of colonial homes and shops, uh, jolly women in bonnets and hoop skirts trundled along tidy streets. Friendly men in vests and calf-high stockings worked the blacksmith shop and other buildings. After an intriguing and mildly educational day, family members could return home, their imagination aglow with visions of the American past. Doubtless those of a skeptical temperament entertained normal questions. What of disease, of poverty, of slavery, and the generalized harshness of the colonial's more severe mentality? The politically correct uplifters may find it difficult to believe but intelligent Americans visiting Williamsburg have over the years thought about such things. Yet now the heavy hoof of the uplifter has transformed this pleasant family tourist stop. Today's visiting family returns home, having been put through an emotional ringer during which many of, the, of man's meaner passions have been dramatically displayed. Skits put on by Williamsburg actors depict cruelty, racial bigotry, and slavery at their worst right before the family's eyes. Terrell then sadly imagines a car ride home in which shocked tourists traumatized by their visit try to make sense of this new national story. Continues, all this is the baleful consequence of new skits obtusely referred to as enslaving Virginia. One of the development managers of Williamsburg's African American program explains that such distressing skits as a slave auction, the harassment of of pathetic black pedestrian by a slave patrol and a discussion by slaves about joining forces with King George's Red Cross Redcoats are attempts to get tourists to confront the reality of racial discrimination. But is a family tourist venue the appropriate place for confronting reality in all its grimness? Frankly, this is not the way I want to spend my vacation. A better place to learn about such grim matters as slavery is in the, hist is in the library with serious book or in the theater with serious drama. Most Americans rather like America which is why, as the years go on, Williamsburg will attract fewer normal Americans and more lunatics. My talk today, then, is about lunatics, I guess. Story number two, exploiting sacred ground. The sky was spotless as I made my way through what seemed to be a gentrifying arts district of Memphis. I wasn't far from my destination, but I already was finding it difficult to imagine a different era, since it was clear that so much had been cleaned up in the last handful of years. Even the trolley trundling past didn't look authentically old, since it was so clearly new. The place even verged on being antiseptic. The sidewalk seemed devoid of any foot traffic. Granted, it was mid-morning weekday, uh, mid weekday in the summer, it is likely the neighborhood's character changed in the evening when the bistros and restaurants began to fill up for happy hours and then again on the weekend 
when the city's farmer's market, located just around the corner, opened for business. I wasn't there, however, to go on a pub crawl or shop for local produce. Where was the museum? It should be close by. And then one block down, I saw it. Not the museum, but the hotel. For those who study the African-American past, and likely for most people who pay even the slightest bit of attention during Black History Month or in their high school social studies units, you could not help but notice the sign. It seems silly to say, but it looked just like it did in the photographs. Granted, there wasn't a crowd of men frozen on the balcony pointing across the street to where James Earl Ray fired his rifle, but they didn't, need, they didn't need to be there to get the effect of the moment. I literally gasped, gasped and my stomach dropped. This was the Lorraine Hotel. Of course, the museum was also the hotel, but the stagecraft of the museum was such, even the vehicles parked outside uh, of the hotel were vintage vehicles similar to those in the parking lot when King was murdered. The stagecraft of the museum was such that when you pulled up to the front of the museum, the only thing you could process was the fact that you were staring at the hotel where King spent his final moments, the hotel from all of the textbooks and documentaries, the hotel you knew even though you had never before stepped foot in the hotel, much less Memphis. Opened in the 1920s as the Windsor Hotel, the building was purchased and renamed by Walter and Louis Bailey in 1945. The Lorraine Hotel became known for its high profile guests who were performing a block away on Beale Street in the heart of Memphis's black community and the incubator of so many of the country's blues performers. After the shock of King's murder, and I mean this literally, it was a shock as co-owner Larie Bailey died of a heart attack after running out into the parking lot and seeing King had been shot. After the shock of King's murder, the subsequent years of urban decline and then a post-segregated renewal that meant that black visitors could stay in other, more modern facilities, the Lorraine faced foreclosure in 1982. It had become a long-term, low-income apartment complex when, where, uh, when local activists and business leaders came together to purchase the space at auction with the intention of turning it into a civil rights museum. The museum opened to the public in September 1991. Before it could open, residents had to leave. Jacqueline Smith refused. When deputies carried her and her belongings out to the curb after a court order, after the heat was turned off, almost a year after the original um, uh, request to leave. When the deputies carried her and her belongings out to the curb, she said, quote, Dr. King would have wanted me to stay here. He said he didn't want any memorial, but he wanted to help the poor. On the morning of her eviction, a sobbing Smith declared that she had no place to go. This is wrong. You people are making a mistake. Smith sat on the sidewalk among her belongings and refused to leave. Very soon, construction fences went up and they broke ground on, on turning the hotel into a museum. Jacqueline Smith was still there. Two years later, she was still there until another court order moved her, well, deputies moved her and her belongings to the other side of the street. When asked by a reporter about, uh, uh, for the Associated Press why she was so opposed to the museum, Smith reasserted her sense that King wanted to serve the poor and that is exactly what the Lorraine was doing when it was closed and she was evicted. For Smith, the Lorraine and King's legacy were being desecrated. This sacred ground is being exploited. Over 20 years have passed since this second forced move. Jacqueline Smith is still there. This is a picture uh, taken um, after 19 years and unfortunately, uh, she's standing right, sitting right here, the, fades out into the, the wheel of the car, so you can't see her. But she's there with her protests um, corner. When I visited, that's 19 years, 202 days. It was 23 years, 224 days. She is still there. I was walking up to the museum, planning just to go into the museum. I didn't know this person existed. I didn't know this protest existed. And I saw something at the corner across from the hotel, and I thought it was, as museums tend to have, um, a, uh, uh, some sort of vendor selling maybe uh, eyes on the prize kind of material before you went into the museum shop and bought your stuff there. So I went over and found this protest at 23 years. I spoke to her for a few moments, feeling very uncomfortable, not knowing what to do talking to her, 
And she simply said, don't go in. I've flown here for only this reason, to go in this museum, to study it. Don't go in. This has all been gentrified. This has not looked like what this place used to look like. They've turned it into Disneyland. Don't go in. I went in. I, I felt I had to go in. But as I tell the story in the book about the Lorraine Hotel, most of the story is about Jacqueline Smith. Most of the story is about, for instance, her website, fulfillthedream.net, that somebody has put up for her. The website that doesn't mince words that says the National Civil Rights Museum has from day one considered the ghoulish needs of the mass tourist market greater than the real need to educate and inform. In one instance only, the museum acknowledges Smith's presence. On the Frequently Asked Questions page, FAQ, for the museum's website, you will find the following at FAQ number eight of 12. Who is the protester outside? Her name is Jacqueline, Jacqueline Smith, and she has protested the museum since ground was broken in 1987, though she has never been inside the museum. Even though the museum recognizes Smith's protest, if only barely, her vigil tells us something valuable, I think, about the production of history, the sanctification of certain experiences over others, and the interplay between an individual and an institution. Here, a single person with a particular set of memories and a, and a determination to remember a figure of such importance like King in a specific way, finds herself facing an institution with a public commitment to remembrance that has become her horror. And this is really what the Colonial Williamsburg story is about as well, is the tension between a public act of remembrance for a range of different reasons. Uh, when when um, Goodwin and Rockefeller came together to imagine Colonial Williamsburg in, uh, decades earlier, they saw it as a national shrine to, the, to American ideals. When I went there in 1970, that's the way I understood the place to be. I mean, it, I was in fourth grade, but I understood that much. That's what it was doing, is performing a certain kind of fundamental Americanness. I like to think a little black militant in me was therefore really riled up that there weren't any black people there, but no, I just thought it was strange. Um, but as we know more about the past, as we learn, as historians and archeologists learn how to read materials that were there in front of them the whole time, that the insistence that we can't know black history or slave history because there's no record of it is actually a false testimony, as it turns out. This is one of the great accomplishments of the archeologist in Colonial Williamsburg that they found there's a tremendous record of a slave past. That changes the narrative, and some people simply don't want the narrative changed. In the case of Jacqueline Smith, she didn't want the narrative changed either. And she asked fair questions. But the museum is there to do important work as well. How do we choose? All of these are really compelling stories, I think. They raise compelling questions. Story number three, a story like no other. This is a, a story about the Southern heritage tourism industry. Since around the same era as the Colonial Williamsburg's uh, attempts to change its narratives, and successful attempts, I should say, state governments in particular have discovered there is a lot of money to be made by telling stories about their past that they never wanted to tell before. These are civil rights tours I'm talking about specifically. And as, as cities like Birmingham and Greensboro and other places that were that are financially wiped out in the in post-industrial era, they started to realize the city fathers, the way they can make money is to build civil rights museums and hopefully bring in tourists. And they have done this quite successfully. Heritage tourism is not about a specific building, but about often um, mem what I'll call memory trails. And uh, gosh, in, in Alabama, it's not in my notes here, it's in the book, in the state of Alabama is very good at this. They have in their state website, there are all these different heritage tours you can go on from a wine and cheese or wine country tour in Alabama, which I didn't know existed, um, uh, to the Hank Williams uh, trail, to a great fishing trail, to civil rights trail. 
coming in the state of Alabama, that's quite phenomen phenomenal. Louisiana, though, has one of the newest ones and really one of the most robust. And in Louisiana, the stakes are really quite high. Petrochemicals being the biggest industry, tourism coming up really hard, uh, even after the wake, in the wake of Katrina, now it's recovered, this, the, uh, the state is recovering, tourist economy will be the biggest economy in Louisiana. And the, the elected officials and, and bureaucrats in Baton Rouge realized, my God, the African-American tourist economy is massive. They're already coming to Louisiana and, and New Orleans in particular. We need to get to take part of that. And so they built the African-American Heritage Trail, uh, a story like no other. And this is a screenshot of the website um, uh, for a story like no other. And what makes this trail so exciting, I guess, to a history geek like me, is that it's not just a website now, but it's also a smartphone app. And in fact, a really excellent smartphone app uh, where you, you tap in, you tap on the app, you can actually, there's 35 different sites within the state of Louisiana. You can punch in the eight different sites you want to go to. There's little stories about each one. The map will tell you literally how to get from one to the other. It's quite beautiful. It's a great way to uh, basically bring in tourist dollars. But what story are people getting on these heritage tours? When you go to that first page, sorry, stop. Okay, good, phew. When you go to this page, you click on the link, um, the, the link that you're invited to, and immediately this comes up. <laughs> Think of the whole setting here, a back road, probably in late winter with Spanish moss hanging off the trees, uh, a romantic invocation of an idealized, sort of authentic, fundamentally natural, these are all in big quotes, um, black experience in Louisiana. The guitar player sings, performing in blissful rapture, and as a montage of images scrolls along the right side of the screen, the viewer sees the politician PBS Pinchback, uh, a politician like no other, Matt, uh, millionaire Madam C.J. Walker before she moves up to Harlem, scenes from the 1953 Baton Rouge, a bus boycott, legendary college football coach Eddie uh, Robinson, musicians playing in a public square, and soul food matriarch Leah Chase. In short, the introduction to A Story Like No Other is about celebration and excellence and nostalgia an invitation to explore the natural roots of the black experience. Now, I actually have no problem with that. We need to get people to go on these tours. You need to find a way to sell uh, a feeling, an aesthetic in some sense. But you have to also think carefully about what are the, the outer boundaries of this narrative. How far does this story go? Will, whose memories will matter? Whose memories do they want to remember, even if you keep remembering your own? Will there be distinction between these types of memories? The stakes are considerable. There is money on the, being left on the table if Louisiana doesn't get the story right. Now, the Office of Tourism in the state of Louisiana, concerned about getting the story right, much to their credit, started to gather data on all these sites. This is building the website and the app, going to all these different places of heritage to find out what was their story. And what they found was an incredible breadth. You have, for instance, the River Road Museum, a very small one-person operation, uh, not even on a shoe string, it's just on an aglet of a budget. Um, and uh, a, a museum that is doing, it's doing all this great work showing um, community gardens of what enslaved uh, African Americans would have planted 
um, around their shacks as they're working in the sugar plantations on River Road in Mississippi. Uh, and it's a demonstration garden, certainly, but it's also literally feeding the community. This is how, this, these are the stakes in Donaldsonville, Louisiana. There is not much there except for prisons. That the museum, which charges a suggested donation of $5, uh, can't get money from the state, can't get money from um, uh, national foundations, National Park Service. They're actually feeding their community as part of the work, their pedagogical work. Then you have the Oak Alley Plantation, uh, privately held uh, space, as there are many of the big house tour phenomena, still privately owned um, property, where the owner of the property, when approached by historians of the state, saying, you know, there are, there are, there's a complex tapestry of stories that can be told about this particular site. The response was, I'm not interested. Oak Alley visitors, this is a quote for the most part, are looking for a gone with the wind kind of fantasy. They come for the hoop skirts, the grandeur, and the elegance. Now get off my land. Now that's my part I'm saying. But, <laughs> but, but essentially, that's what they're saying. As part of my research, I went on the Louisiana African American Heritage Trail, picked seven or eight sites. One of them, I figured I had to do a plantation tour, a big house tour. I'm gonna tell that story. I'd never been to a plantation before. Visiting relics of a simpler era, a simpler era, never appealed to me. My reluctance was predictable, of course, as anyone who isn't a romantic about the antebellum South would understand. But here I was on the Evergreen Plantation, not the one I just told you about, the Evergreen Plantation, a major stop on the Louisiana African American Heritage Trail. About a dozen of us gathered for the walking tour. If I had to guess, most people were there to see the big house. I was interested in this as well, but I was mainly there to see the other buildings. It so happens that Evergreen Plantation has the largest collection of original buildings from the era of antebellum plantation farming, over 35 buildings, in fact. The big house, the gardens, the pigeon air, all of these places were interesting or lovely, but more so as a collection of still life structures or settings. The kitchen, however, was mesmerizing not for the three shells of darky memorabilia, uh, collectibles, mammy salt shakers and such, that had no relationship to the antebellum past but were carefully displayed all the same, but for the way the tour guide explained the daily obligations of the slaves who fixed the meals for the residents in the big house. The ghosts began to arrive at that moment when the guide demonstrated how the heavy pots would rest over the burning wood, how the cooks would use long iron rods to manipulate those pots, how they rose every day, day in and day out, to sustain those who shackled them. I was dumbfounded, though, when we moved toward the slave cabins. There they were, ominously silent, down a haunted allay of oak trees, absolutely still, waiting for us. Much to my surprise, I was very hesitant to go down that path. I felt I was trespassing. I was going where I did not belong. But I also admit to being confused because these weren't my people. My people were from North Carolina and Virginia. They weren't from Southern Louisiana. The presence of the figurative and psychological connection, however, could not be denied. These were my people. History told me as much, even though history also told me that reducing a radically diverse population into a people was intellectually lazy. Nevertheless, before I walked up, to the step, up the steps to the first slave cabin, I silently apologized for paying $20 to buy a ticket to see the plantation and to pay for the upkeep of the big house. I apologized to all of them, Henry White, Apollon, Ben Lewis, Joshua, John, Edmund, Tom Brown, Manuel, Sterling, Crouch, Moses, Fleming, Alfred, Robert, Terry, George, Benjamin Harrison, Nelson, Baptiste, Abraham, Ambrose, Squire, Aaron, Jackson, Anderson, Tom, Henry, Ben, Jean-Pierre, Joe, Pierre, Lindben, Ursul, Suzanne, Genevieve, Fanny, 
Chloe, Duncan, Dunka, Sabel, Hector, Ebony, Will, Ursine, Clara, Jacques, Germaine, Alexis, and two children unnamed, all of whom are listed as property. Considering the distant silence that accompanied the displayed porcelain grotesqueries in the kitchen, the cost per person of maintaining the big house, which was actually still private property and occupied in the off season, the fact that I was, only, that I was the only black person on the tour, and that some of our group arrived as part of a day-long private bus tour, moving them from one plantation to another, I found myself taking deep breaths, trying to gird myself for whatever whitewashed narrative the tour guide would offer about the slave cabins. The guide, however, surprised me. This is hallowed ground, she said. We don't know enough about the people who worked this land and who lived in these cabins. We do know, however, that they were skilled farmers and craftsmen and that they built everything that we have seen today. What I found to be remarkable in the moment, as it turns out, was a noted shift in the narrative a visitor to Evergreen would have heard just a few years earlier. Then visitors to Evergreen would still have seen the slave cabins, but the tour's focus would have been entirely on the plantation house and the white occupied spaces. The kitchen, now a site where one learns how slaves fled the, fed the plantation, was then merely the place where the owner hosted dinner parties. Granted, the mammy figurines remain, but one can imagine they played a more interactive role during the dinner parties than in their perched gargoyle-like silence one finds today. My tour guide didn't reference them at all. There's no doubting that visitors will come to Ever still come to Evergreen primarily to see the plantation house, and it is likely that they may see the slave cabins as something more akin to spectacle than a site of violence, subjugation, and loss. The tour guide's changing narrative, however, is a reflection of an evolving sensibility about how to tell stories about the black past. At Baton Rouge's Magnolia Mound Plantation, curators have been chipping away in a similar fashion at older, more traditional narratives that focus their attention on the plantation house. Here I'm talking about archeological digs uh, where there was no building there anymore, but they find shards of glass and pottery that we now know are actual um, uh, relics of people who might have been healers in the slave community. And we now know more about uh, the kind of foods that they fix for themselves or how they manage their lives. And the Magnolia Mound Plantation uh, uh, curators started working to restore these slave cabins, long since had burned down or fallen down or just been just knocked down. And they, start, they are now telling a new story to the young kids who come here, ages fourth, fourth grade to 12th grade, telling them a story explicitly about who worked in the big house and who lived in the slave cabins and where the cabins were. They have one now on the site, but they know there was a row of about 10 in that particular place. So much of the narrative that is written into the script for tour guides to tell these uh, elementary school kids is about this is a serious visit, especially when, they, especially when they get to the slave quarters. This is serious stuff. No joking around, no wisecracks. There's another serious thing about Magnolia Mound Plantation that's really not part of the script, but it's something the curators are trying to deal with. Magnolia Mound is now a 16-acre site, which used, uh, a place that used to encompass 950 acres. In fact, Baton Rouge and suburbs have grown around uh, Magnolia Mound. Now, the size of the, of the site, what remains, isn't so much a problem, but the research staff is now certain that the private homes abutting the property nearest to the restored slave cabin um, also happen to be built upon slaves on marked graves. That a suburban life is perched above unmarked slaves' graves is a silent grotesquery that Magnolia Mound's curators will never be able to address unless they can start buying up rows of currently occupied homes, something that is unlikely ever to happen. Perhaps the most powerful side of mortal anonymity, however, is found on the edge of downtown New Orleans in Treme, the city's sixth ward. Often referred to as the long time, <clears throat> long time uh, historic home 
to New Orleans black population, there are several stops on the Heritage Trail, the Louisiana African American Heritage Trail, within blocks of each other. The first uh, New Orleans African American, the first rate New Orleans African American Museum is near to Congo Square and Louis Armstrong Park. Uh, between the two is St. Augustine Church, one of the oldest churches in North America serving a largely black and Catholic congregation. The history of the church itself is impressive as it speaks to the unique relationship between blacks, Creoles, and whites in a part of the city that has been the economic, social, and cultural home to generations of blacks. But it is a small memorial that is outside the church that speaks in utter silence to the horror of loss and trauma that undergirds so much of the history that tourists experience on the Heritage Trail. At first glance, the memorial looks like a small garden with a curious set of crosses planted in it. But upon closer inspection, a powerful force is at work. There are multiple small crosses of various size and design planted among the tropical grasses. Looming over them is a massive cross. It leans at a 45 degree angle and appears to have been made out of a ship's anchor chain. Tangled in this cross, you can see where my mouse is right here. Tangled in this cross <coughs> are half a dozen slave shackles some intact, some broken. This is the tomb of the unknown slave. Dedicated in October 2004, the St. Augustine community created this site to honor the, quote, memory of the nameless, faceless, turfless Africans who died in Treme. More than this, however, the shrine was a call to remember all slaves who lie buried in unmarked graves. The tomb's memorial plaque acknowledges that the tomb tells a story that is as boundless as, as its subjects are nameless. And I quote, there is no doubt that the campus of St. Augustine Church sits astride the blood, sweat, tears, and some of the mortal remains of unknown slaves from African and local American Indian slaves. In other words, the tomb of the unknown slave is a constant reminder that we are walking on holy ground Thus, we cannot consecrate this tomb because it is already consecrated by many slaves and glorious deaths bereft of any acknowledgement, dignity, or respect. As a site of historical performance, the tomb of the unknown slave is a powerful marker of loss, absence, injustice, and cruelty. Although based in historical fact, it is, in the end, a figurative assertion, a silent sentinel over a racial horror that is boundless and timeless even as it also happens to be stop number two in a story like no other. Thank you. Now I stopped early with this hope that there are questions about, about this or other parts of the project, so the floor is yours. And I'll do my best bob and weave if I have to. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, that's a great question. It's about historical reenactors. When um, before the curators at Williamsburg felt comfortable going to slave auction, the first step was literally getting an actors, uh, reenactors to play that role of slaves. And uh, it became really controversial uh, because um, it was a race, these were racially defined roles, certainly. Um, but because people, they started to have, they started to have um, problems because you can't break character. And what they discovered, much to their horror and to the reenactor's horror, are a couple of things. Is that a lot of tourists who are there simply to have a grand old time in a beautiful setting, and it is a beautiful setting, um, strangely started to act in a way that, that I think they might have been horrified themselves to discover. Not that they were trying to um, relive an enslaved system, but the people who were, who were acting as slaves became invisible to them. Um, that they, were, they became part of the scenery, as it were, 
and they weren't human actors in the way the other reenactors were. There's a strange psychology at work there. And there were stories of reenactors uh, getting in trouble because they couldn't take it any longer and they broke character to deal with people who were, you know, who were cheering along when part of the performance was uh, of a group of people harassing a slave as part of the reenactment. And that visitors started getting into it. And some of the reenactors said, I can't, I literally can't take this any longer. And broke character, and then you, if you break, I don't know, if you're, you're disciplined in some way, I mean, it's your job. And then they found another thing happening is that some of the people who were hired as overseers to manage the slaves, they started getting into very strange emotional and psychological space. Because they, these are people who were their friends often, but the more they, and they felt uncomfortable knowing it's a performance, but, yeah, you know, but they can rationalize that as, as a performance, but at some moment, something happened. And they started expecting behavior out of the actors. And so you had these white overseers um, needing, and I use this term, I don't know if they literally needed counseling, but basically seeking help because they were just found themselves in a very unsettling space as well. Now, the historian in me thinking about things in a vacuum think this is a fantastic pedagogical exercise. They can learn all about the psychological trauma of slavery. Um, but, you know, the reality is this is horrible for everybody, which is the broader point, of course. But if we're going to do, and this is, the, this is the challenge of public history, if you're going to tell a really complicated story, how do you do it? And how do you do it in a way that will still bring people in? Because the fact is you need them to come in, not just because you want them to learn the story, but because you need their money, especially these days when there's no government anymore, apparently. Um, you need their money. And this is why at the end of every, I mean, this is classic museum performance, you know, uh, right after you go through whatever tourist spa uh, space you're on, the exit is at the, the gift shop. It has to be. Uh, and now this is getting away from your, re your reenactors question, but you know, when I was going on these, I went to um, the uh, International Civil Rights Center, which is the Greensboro Woolworths um, sit-in site. I was at, um, in Memphis, uh, for, at the Lorraine Hotel, National Civil Rights Museum. Um, when, you, when you go through these spaces, you are not going through feeling good. It's just like, and, and you know, now I study the points so I can be a little, maybe a little more clinical or seeing how they're doing, but after a while you're like, man, this is, oh, <laughs> it's just, this is horrible. I don't want to be here, but I'm supposed to be here. I'm supposed to learn something here. And then you walk out into a store where there's like, you know, uh, motivational cards and t-shirts and hats and mugs. I'm like, I mean, and I actually bought some of the stuff thinking I was going, well, I bought it actually clinically, thinking this is gonna be part of the project to read the commercial aspect of the museums. And then I also discovered that there's this little industry in these museums that the same items that were for sale in Greensboro were also for sale in um, Memphis. And it just makes sense. I mean, there are vendors who are, who are selling uplifting stories about survival and such, at these, uh, survival and triumph. Um, but it is strange to really come to terms that these are commercialized spaces, um, trying to tell complicated stories. And those two things don't line up very well, um, ever, it seems. And, um, and the reenactors, in this case, literally uh, embody that kind of challenge and problem. Yes. Yes, Danny. No, I don't, actually. <laughs> now, now, say, now, before we get into this, <laughs> Danny has known I've been working on this book for how, how come I don't know this story yet? Uh, I to say this ah, I see. <laughs> <laughs> wow.
that's a great story. <laughs> Wish I had known it in time. <laughs> I mean, I did know that, uh, he, uh, that he worked before moving to the college fund to uh, help to integrate National Park Service um, uh, sites. Um, but I didn't know that story. <laughs> Any other questions that will tell me more about the book that I wish I uh, could have put in there? <laughs> Good grief. Yes, Ethan. Right. Um, so I've actually not seen 12 Years a Slave yet. I did see the butler. Um, as research, to be honest. Uh, the, um, <laughs> the uh, it's an interesting tension for me in the, in the phenomenon of we need to know, I think, we need to know more and more stories about our nation's past, and that we really need to know uh, stories that have not yet been told of our nation's past. And those are stories of you know, black, brown, gay, impoverished women. These, those are the stories we're still trying to figure out in many ways, and we know this. What, so in that way, for a Hollywood movie, I actually really appreciated the kind of cultural work that the butler is doing. Um, and also, for someone who grew up in the D.C. area, I thought it was just fun, you know, just inter it was entertaining, in the sense, to imagine these strange worlds. Now, but I didn't see it for those reasons, really. I was seeing, trying to look for an interesting connection. Um, and this does speak to where I think the butler is doing some really important work that I think is mostly lost in the conversation, from what I've seen of the conversation. Well, it, it, you see a bit of it, but I don't think it's fully developed. And this is a story about my other grandfather. That was my maternal grandfather. This is my paternal grandfather. So the, I was, um, after my father retired for the Air Force, he worked in government and then worked as a lobbyist um, for Ford Motor Company. So I grew up going to the Capitol with him just on errands. And my father's the kind of person who walks in an elevator and starts conversations. He knew everybody. And this is just the way he was. So I would just walk around tagging along with my father and he'd, you know, see, he knew everybody, they knew him. And he secured through these connections for me one summer when I was in college, uh, a really fancy internship with the House Ethics Committee. And at a moment, as it turns out, it was pretty important when Newt Gingrich, who was a backbencher, started to go after Speaker Wright. So it was actually a pretty interesting summer on the House Ethics Committee. Well, on the day of the beginning of the internship, he insists on taking me to the, in, the, the location, the chambers. I'm 19 or 20 years old. I'm like, I can handle this, Dad. It's, I'm fine. It turns out I couldn't have found the place. The, the bowels of the Capitol are endlessly you know, complex. But as we walk along, he's glad hatting everybody, you know, being his lobbyist self. And then he gets kind of quiet as we approach what it turns out to be the doors of, of the ethics committee. And then out of the blue, Right before we get to the door, he goes, now hang on a second. I want to tell you something. Don't let people tell you that there hasn't been progress. I don't know where this is coming from. Don't let people tell you there hasn't been progress. Because the only way you know, that you could cross this threshold, we're about to cross, when I was your age, is if we were pushing, if, if we were pushing carts of food. So all of a sudden, everything became clear. The reason he got this gig for me is that he was old friends with the guy who was chair of the committee, Julian Dixon, late Julian Dixon, African-American. So he goes, this is a big deal. You are the chair's intern. And the subscript was, uh, was that the chair is, is African-American as well. And here I am walking in as a paid intern, which is a big deal back then. Uh, probably, probably even a bigger deal now, actually. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and he just left me at that moment and just walked away. I'm like, what the, what, what, what? And then I started to piece other things together, realizing that it wasn't, he knew the Capitol so well, not because of his days as a lobbyist, because lobbyists just don't walk freely in the building, um, not in those areas. He knew it because he grew up running around in that area, because his father was a waiter in the House Representatives' dining room. But his father, every year, sorry, the school year, you have to fill up the form about 
what jobs you have and whatever. So, you know, it's a typical public school form you gotta send in. And my father kept always getting in trouble because his father would never turn in the form, would never fill out the form. And the reason he never filled out the form because it required him to fill in occupation. And in my grandfather's mind, he was never a waiter. He was a lawyer. He had gone to Howard University in the uh, late 1920s. Um, at the moment, he didn't know it then, when he was about to reorganize, be reorganized for accreditation, to move from a two-year night school to a three-year curriculum that looks more from what we look like today, understand today. And he was on the, in the second year when this, accredit, when this change happened, and the school refused to grandfather those second-year students in. He was about a graduate with a JD, and then started a career as an attorney in Washington, D.C. Um, and yet, the school didn't grandfather this class of maybe eight or 12 men, and most of them uh, gathered together to sue the law school for their degree. He literally could not afford it. Great Depression, had a young kid, uh, and so he went to work. And by connections, he got a job at the House of Representatives Dining Hall. A great gig. You, this is a job for life. And through that job, he actually was able to secure an appointment for my, uh, for my father at West Point, which my father declined, which drove my grandfather crazy. Um, so he had done all that work to prepare his son and family for the future, but in his mind, he was always an attorney, not a waiter. And the damning thing is that his friends, his classmates, won their case a few years later and became attorneys. So when I see the movie The Butler, and you see the kinds of internal battles, this I'm imagining going on in the character, Forrest Whitaker's character's mind, confused in some way by this next generation that he's raised, and their sense of privilege or lack of appreciation for what they had to swallow to stand upright and do their jobs. To me, that's a powerful, powerful story. More than just father, son, battles, whatever. That, I mean, that's an obvious kind of thing, of course. But it's really about um, individuals who work their tails off in positions that uh, in my paternal grandfather's case, he thought was beneath him because his own social class sensibility. And yet he did it. And he did it with a particular agenda in mind. Now that is a great American story about trying to raise up a family and do the right thing. It's not a black story, although it is. I mean, it's just a great American story. Um, and in the case of the butler, it's a great American story told in black face with all the kinds of slings and arrows that come with it. So, you know, for Hollywood, I think that's pretty fabulous. You know, for mainstream, you know, Hollywood. Um, but, you know, I need to see uh, 12 Years a slave, slave, I need to see Fruitvale Station, I need to see these are a whole other industry of films, um, um, industry of films, whole other uh, series of films that are out now. Um, people are calling it a renaissance. I don't even begin that for, believe that for a second. We'll see. Um, uh, but, you know, if we, if we can have in our, in, our, uh, in our cultural political economy a less immature conversation about race and possibility, I don't care where it comes from. I think that's pretty cool. Um, so I embrace the butler for that reason. Yes, Curtis. So I'll tell the story behind it first. Lucille Clifton, amazing poet, um, uh, state of Maryland, was asked to be the poet laureate of Maryland, African-American woman. And she, it was a great honor. She goes, I'll be happy to accept that honor. And, they, and it was coming up on the, I think, the 150th anniversary of statehood, of the settlement of, of Maryland, colonial Maryland. And they're having, as one would expect, a year of celebration. And um, the, so she was asked as the poet laureate of Maryland if she would write a poem to celebrate, and I, th and I'm, I, I hope I have this right, um, happy colonial days. <laughs> so, well, <laughs> whoever asked her to write that poem was, didn't know their history very well. And they didn't know Lucille Clifton at all. Um, 
So she goes, well, okay, I'll try. And she wrote many different versions, and they did not like her versions at all. Um, and finally, she wrote a poem um, titled, um, <laughs> I got the title right here. It's not in my notes, sorry. Titled, Why Some People Be Mad at Me Sometimes is the name of the poem. Because people who gave her this task were really pissed off at her. And this is her poem. They ask me to remember, but they want me to remember their memories, and I keep on remembering mine. That's my whole book, to be honest. I mean, right there, in five lines. Whose memories matter? Whose stories have value? Which ones are loud in the pantheon of, of national culture and of belonging? Uh, and really, what do, what do these stories, or these memories, what do they tell us when people are so bothered by them as well? That we can't have X in a uh, uh, um, statue of um, Arthur Ashe on Richmond's um, monumental way. I mean, what is that telling us about a side of remembrance and whose stories matter and what has value. These aren't, it doesn't tell you happy things, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, it's telling you grave things, but it tells you a lot about the American character and about the work that we have left to do. And I think I'm gonna end right at that moment. Thank you, Curtis. Thank you all.